राज्य साम्राज्य विभूतिरेशा भवत कृपा श्री महिम प्रसादात प्राप्ता मया श्री गुरवे महात्मने नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमस्तस्म सदकस्म कस्म चिन्मसे नम यदेतूपेण राजते गुरुराजते यदि तूपेण राजते गुरुराजते so our topic is meditation its aim and limitation over the last quite a few years maybe 20 years or so the meditation has become such a popular topic everywhere people do many things various ways it has become a very common place term <coughs> we when we speak about meditation we speak from the vedantic point of view from the upanishadic point of view as a method to find out discover the truth the ultimate truth when we say truth that means the ultimate reality about the whole universe and also the truth about our own self who am i of that the meditation is a is an ancient well known method if we look at the i don't know whether you will be interested in listening to that part of it but we can present it always from the point of view of truth because yoga another very popular name particularly in usa what we do in the name of yoga the asana pranayama and basically asana and pranayama and various other things actually truly speaking yoga means union it means union union of what that our rishis who investigated within to find out our real truth who am i the real we will refer to that i as the real identity we have a constructed egoistic identity about ourselves there our body appearance memory friends relatives everything comes into that concept of the i we generally deal with that i is limited by the body mind complex with that constricted small i we enjoy we suffer we move around in the world but when they looked within and find out discovered that real identity that was the step when they found that this egoistic constricted identity the small i getting dissolved into a transcendental consciousness which we call our real i so why it is called yoga because it is the dissolution or union or fusion of the small constricted identity the egoistic identity we think we are into the transcendental universal identity so
So this is called real yoga. All other we practice in the name of yoga, they are elementary steps to take us to that. That is, asana is done to train, discipline our body. Pranayama, pranayama the term means actually pranasya ayama, means the disciplining the vital energy. The prana means the vital energy. We have to discipline our body, we have to discipline our vital energy, we have to discipline our senses. So they are the preliminary steps which will allow us to go to that inner depth which we want to go. Otherwise, our whenever we try to meditate also, the common problem we hear is the mind runs here and there, we are not able to meditate. The tendency of the mind always to run around. So it to have the mind withdraw within, to fix within, it needs, definitely it needs some discipline of the body, vital energy, everything. So it is also necessary to really to meditate. When we want to meditate, this yoga practice is necessary step for that. But it is an elementary step. The real yoga, we all pursue this asana, pranayama, etc. to attain that final union that is the small constricted identity which we are not happy with actually. We think that we, are, we undergo suffering and enjoyment but we are not fulfilled with that. So the whole effort of our rishis was to understand and solve this problem once for all. And in that process, then when they looked inside and discovered their real identity, they found a solution. So that is the method of going within and getting finally dissolved into our real identity is called dhyana. It is a method, dhyana, which we translate in English as meditation. <laughs> Does it agree with your concept of meditation? So this is what real meditation is. Real means this is the Vedantic meditation which has the aim of discovering our real identity, discovering the ult ultimate truth and ultimate the truth about our own identity also. Now, what made them look within? What I am talking about it is a prehistoric knowledge. If you think really, you will find it is amazing that even Bhagavad Gita was written 5150 or so years ago. And Bhagavad Gita is writing that it is the knowledge presented in the Upanishad we are presenting through in a different form in Bhagavad Gita. We say that the presentation in Bhagavad Gita is a revolutionary presentation when we consider the Upanishadic knowledge, the same knowledge which was available in our country, but it was restricted to a very few people, those who do not have, those who did not have any attraction and repulsion towards the likes and dislikes of the world. They could take to this pursuit we call it exclusive knowledge pursuit. That was the Upanishadic pursuit. People were not fit to take it. Even now, we are all the more not fit to pursue it because our mind will not get fixed to the knowledge or to the meditative practice. <coughs> so, the knowledge was there in the Upanishads, but the takers were very few. Those who have already lived their life in a fulfilling manner, as far as the objective uh, enjoyment is concerned, they would take to it and go to the hermitage or in the forest and go to the guru, the teacher, and learn and practice. Like that it was going on. <coughs> now what made them suddenly look within? Here I have to go a little into the knowledge part of it. Two things were, two doubts or two enquiries they had. One is that, right from the beginning, we are always 
finding in the world everything is fluctuating everything is changing the very basis of creation is changefulness without that no creation can be there energy is the basis of creation so it is change energy means change so is there not anything permanent because to know anything changeful we have a permanent background suppose the clock if the dial also moves with the arms then we will not know the movement any movement to be revealed that should be a permanent substratum or basis is there not such anything which is permanent which is unchanging because in the outside world everything is changeful even the whole galaxy also is getting destroyed getting burned everywhere it is change 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 in our life also every moment we are changing our body is changeful our mind is changing our intelligence is undergoing changes so who where can i find the unchanging permanence that was one quest <coughs> the other quest which is absolutely a very simple logic but still we forget about it that in this world everything follows causality whatever is happening there is a cause and effect change chain suppose even the sun radiating the hydrogen is getting converted into helium and the radiation is coming out in the sun there is a change the proportion of hydrogen is reducing and proportion of helium is increasing and also there is change outside also everywhere it is changing and it is following the causality suppose i want unless i push the table it will not move when i am pushing it is moving from birth we understand that everything is related by causality if i take food then the hunger will be satiated if i don't eat then the hunger will not be satiated suppose you go on taking food and you find that the hunger is not going then you will start questioning that am i taking food then what is happening i am still hungry i have eaten for one hour even then i am hungry so everything is following causality so naturally seeing that we feel that anything happening in nature there must be a cause so what is the cause behind this whole universe then you will be surprised that the concept of god came from there we conceived of some god either in superhuman being or a cosmic intelligence or whatever we may say that in the objective there is something who has created the universe because we want a cause for the universe if you had not looking for the universe we would not have thought about god is it not so the first thought about god came because we were trying to apply the causality in the absolute level to find out what is the cause of the universe but the fact is that if god has created this universe the normal natural question will be who has created god that the children will ask the as our enquiry gets subdued we will not ask any more but the children may ask and we may slap him also that oh what is this question but actually it is a question logical sequence will make us question that so in our culture they have devised a very clever truncation saying that brahma the creator that means the god the creator of the universe he is swayam bhu swayam bhu means he is born of himself it is only artificially fooling us and truncating our enquiry that is we will not reply further the first creator he is born of himself but our spirituality doesn't stop there they say that even if it is swayam bhu he has born of himself if he has created the universe then he is related by causality he is the cause of the universe so it is absolutely logical to ask what is the cause of brahma so this causal logic suppose we take that we find out b is the cause of a 
then naturally the question will be, what is the cause of B? Oh, C is the cause of B. What is the cause of C? Like that even if you go up to Z, you will ask, what is the cause of Z? So, this causality will never take us to a fundamental ground. In science we call it infinite regression. That is, as far back you go, it is never going to end. The causal chain is never going to end. We are born of our parents, parents are born of their parents, they are born of their parents. Like that it will go on. The cause will never, cause and, cha cause and effect chain will never end. So, if at all there is any absolute truth or ultimate truth, ultimate reality, by definition it has to transcend causality. This is a simple logical conclusion. It cannot be within the cause and effect logical fold. It has to, when I say it has to transcend causality or beyond causality, it means it is beyond time also because time and causality they are intimately bound. The cause is what proceeds in time and the effect is what follows in time. So, they could not find any anything they can land on which can be the cause of the entire universe. That was one question. The other question was looking for permanence, that everything is changeful. Is there not anything permanent? Both are more or less same. When we think deeply, both are more or less same. The other quest they had is emotional. What is the emotional quest? That we have been thinking that something from the world will make us happy. But when we really go into it, has anybody become happy by getting anything from the world? Suppose the richest person in the world, is he fulfilled with his riches? The most famous person in the world, is he fulfilled with his whatever he has got from the world? The most beautiful, anything. And this is not only now, if you look far back, entire in the time period, nowhere you will find anybody who has become fulfilled by getting anything from the world. They discovered that nothing from the world is going to make me fulfilled. Then is there not any fulfillment? The human life, can we not become fulfilled by anything? That was another quest. So these three, or we will say these two, let us say because causality and change, that is the same thing. This led, to, led them to look within. That who am I who is looking, uh, looking into this changeful universe? Let me first analyze that. Because we have already thought about the objective world. Nowhere we are going to find any absolute level which we can call the ultimate reality or which, we can, which can fulfill us. Now when they started looking within to find out who am I? What was the step? Initially, naturally, they will look within because they will, the I amness feeling is coming from within. So, we cannot think of discovering the I somewhere in the loft or so. Can we? We cannot find our I there. We have to, do, to look within. I, to find out the I, we have to look within where from the amness or the I ness is coming, which is in our all behavior we are finding. So, when they looked within, they found that. The body, I am sometimes saying I am sick and sometimes I am saying but my body is not all right today. There is a contradiction. In one case, I am associating with the body, I am sick. Another case, we are saying it is my body, I am not that. Truly speaking, I am not the body because I am seeing all the changes taking place in the body. If we look back in memory, we find that I, the body was small, from there it has changed. Even every moment also the body is changing. Now it is uh, not all right, it is sick. Yesterday it was all right, like that. Every time it is undergoing a change. So, I am the observer of the body, the witness of the body. I am not the body, but body is what I am seeing. Similarly, if we look into the mind, the mind is undergoing change. 
it was something a few years back, even a, an hour back perhaps it was happy, now it is not happy, gloomy, etc. The, all the changes I am seeing. So, I am the observer, I am the witness of the mind. I am not the mind. Mind is an object for me. Object means, when I say object, don't think it is a gross object. Mind is a subtle object. Body is a gross object, but the mind is a subtle object which I am knowing, I am witnessing. And it is revealed to my consciousness. Similarly, about intelligence also we find the change is taking place in the intelligence. It was sharp, it is not sharp now, or it was dull, it is sharp now, whatever. So, everything we are finding that I am the observer of the body, I am the observer of the mind, I am the observer of the intelligence also. I am slowly taking you to meditation. Don't think that I am speaking something else. This is the way we are approaching the inmost level. Then comes the real problem for any seeker. Then how am I to find out that I? That I, which is the observer of the body, observer of the mind, observer of the intelligence, but how to find out which is, what is that I? Now, this effort to find out the I itself has a problem in it. Because when we are trying to discover the I, if you look within, you will find that we are trying to see the I as different from myself. I want to see the I before me. Am I clear? That is, as I am looking at the objects of the world, gross objects, as I am looking into the thoughts inside or emotions inside, they are all objects before me, I am seeing them. Like that I want to see my I. Am I behaving rationally there? If you see, if I see the I as different from me, then it is not the I. The seer is the I, the seen cannot be the I when it is different from me. Do you get my point? So, our very effort to discover the self as something I want to discover, this effort itself is making the self non-self. Making the subject object. It is objectivizing the subject. Is it clear? So, what to do? Our very effort at meditation to discover the inmost self is making the self non-self. So, will we be successful in the meditative approach there? That was the great problem. But what happened is that they found that if here our tendency to look at something different from me is causing the problem. Tendency, there is a natural tendency, as we are looking at the objective world in the objects, we still hear when we are trying to discover the subject also, we have the tendency to look at something like an object. Not clear? <laughs> so that is the problem. So one has to become effortless, this effort has to go. The effort for discovering the self has to drop at the last point. And somehow, we call it surrender or so, whatever. When that effort is taken away, that effort is let go, then suddenly they understood the Self revealed itself. There was the discovery. What is that? The Self, our consciousness, the I in us, the amnes in us, which is revealing the entire external world, which is revealing the internal world of thoughts, emotions, everything, that Self, when there is no world, nothing to reveal, no thought at all, everything has been surrendered, the Self reveals itself. And that was one of the greatest discoveries of our country and of human race also. Because it was a solution in one go for many things. They found that they were landing in a, not they were landing, that in that position, that I, that constricted egoistic I, 
vanished and they were flooded with joy the first discovery was they were flooded with joy and they sang that ananda dheva khalvimani bhutani jayanti that the whole universe is born of ananda it is remaining in ananda means joy it is sustained by ananda it gets dest- it gets destruct when it is destroyed it gets merged in the ananda that ananda as the basis the joy as the basis of everything that joy which is a natural coordinate of our own self carrying that i throughout our life we are suffering we are becoming small we are becoming cheerless but not knowing that the joy is our natural birthright joy is the natural coordinate of our self so it was a great discovery which fulfilled them emotionally as well as intelligentially how intelligentially they discovered that the truth is not in the objectivity the whole objectivity the whole external world internal world of emotion um, thoughts intelligential analysis everything is an appearance in that consciousness which we call i the real i that is the real identity <laughs> so that started the perhaps the meditation was introduced like that when somebody discovered like that he said he gave a call to the whole humanity to oh, you listen you are all children of immortality now i will just make one division when we say immortality we have the feeling that it never dies but true immortality means it is beyond causality because anything that is within the fold of cause and effect chain will not be mortal it will get born and it will die so when we are saying something is immortal that means it has to be beyond the objectivity objectivity means the whole objective sphere it has to be beyond causality so they discovered that this consciousness it is not an object that is why you cannot discover it as something different from you had it been an object you would have discovered like that but this is this consciousness what i am that is the amness in us that is giving rise to the small i also so when they discovered this consciousness as the substratum of the entire universe that the whole universe is appearing in that consciousness both the quest were fulfilled one is that they got the clue to the source of joy that it is our own real identity our inmost level joy is our birthright and also there lies the ultimate truth the unchanging which is transcending causality and time that is our real identity it is not limited by the body mind personality my body mind personality is a small speck in the nature it is an evolute of nature it is produced by nature that body mind personality is part of it's a small speck in nature the where the whole universe of which my body mind personality is a small speck is appearing in that consciousness when i say that consciousness you will again have an objective idea about consciousness is something it is not like that at all they will find the whole universe appearing in him in that so in one go it solved both the quest intelligential as well as emotional then they analyzed that <coughs> if this is so then when we fulfill some objective some desire how is it that we get joy out of it their analysis was that suppose we are intensely looking for something intensely wanting something in that case when that aim is fulfilled is not the joy also is intense when we are intensely wanting to do something when that aim is fulfilled 
is not the joy also intense hmm so because when we are intensely wanting something then the small small desires fear anxieties they leave us because our focus is intensely on what we are wanting normally our mind is always cluttered by various desires various anxieties fears and what not these fear, these agitations are like the ripples on the on a lake which does not allow which do not allow us to see the bottom of the lake suppose there are ripples on the lake surface we cannot see the bottom when the ripples subside then we can the bottom is revealed like that in meditation when all the agitations all thoughts emotions intelligential activity everything got subsided the soul revealed itself so when we are intensely looking for something the all other small small fear desire anxiety everything subsides they leave and when that desire is fulfilled then for a longer period of time the mind remains free of all desire fear anxiety everything is it not so we feel the joy also intensely at that time other joys will be small and short at time suppose <coughs> you are looking for you are making a building <coughs> so you are the day you get into the new building and you have your entry and all you are so happy everything is fine nice but after a few days or even the sec- next day itself when the troubles come up we have to repair this repair that and so many other things the joy has already gone the joy of entering the new building is almost gone if not next day it after some time it will go because by that time the other things again cloud our mind suppose you are seeing for the first time you are seeing the ocean huge vast ocean your mind is so happy seeing the ocean right that point a news comes that you have lost your job or lost your some very close somebody whom you love what happens to the mind is it not will it not collapse the where is the joy gone the joy of the sea if it is in the sea the sea is still in front the object is still in front sea or anything anything that makes us happy the moment the mind got something which it is not ready to accept or ready to bear the mind became small and it is no longer able to have the joy what happened when you first saw the sea seeing a something new and vast the mind got freed of all its small small cluttering thoughts fears anxieties everything they had all gone for a certain time seeing the new beautiful scenic place or the sea you forgot everything and immediately the mind took the you can say the form of the sea mind became expanded it was infinite and you got the joy of an expanded mind which is our birthright but we don't allow the mind to be expanded by always plugging it to small small desire small small fear small small anxiety fear of losing what we like fear of facing what we dislike always the mind is cluttered with that so when the mind is free of the desire it naturally gets the joy there are many other instances also we can take suppose in the deep sleep when you don't have any dream also at that time you are not aware because you are sleeping but when you get up you feel if you have a, if you have had a deep, deep sleep then you feel very ref- refreshed so that again the whole day you can work and you can do whatever to be done in the sleep what happened there was no thought at all deep sleep i am talking about not dream dream is not that pleasant or it might be something just like the wakeful period in dream also you will have some joy some and happiness suffering some fear also fearful dreams are there so it will not make the mind comfortable placid 
But deep sleep will make the mind completely energized because at that time there was no thoughts in the mind. No thoughts, when I say it means no world. Not even your own egoistic personality. When there is no world means your personality which is part of the world, that also was forgotten. So when the whole objectitude is forgotten, then the mind automatically it is in the lap of the soul, it is in the ananda, the joy of the soul and it gets regenerated. That is why after the sleep we feel regenerated. So the main conclusion of all these things is that, that we feel that the fulfillment of the desires give us joy. But truly it is the elimination of the desire that give us, gives us joy. Do you get my point? When the desire is fulfilled, what has happened? The desire has gone. When any desire is fulfilled, then the desire is no more there in the mind. And that absence of the desire makes the mind placid, makes the mind peaceful. In that peaceful state of the mind, automatically the joy which is always oozing forth from the soul, you are able to feel it, you are able to know it. So it is not really the fulfillment of the desire. Suppose you eliminate the desire right in the beginning, you will become joyous. That is what is happening in the deep sleep. The same thing happens, suppose in meditation, those who have been successful, they will always report the first success in meditation when it has happened, we get flooded with joy. <coughs> and when does it happen? When everything is forgotten. That is why the term has come very popular that people say thoughtlessness, thoughtlessness. In those who try to meditate, they always say thoughtlessness, thoughtlessness. Why? And they go on struggling with the thoughts to get them away from the mind finally becoming a defeated soldier, tired after meditation. Actually, the meditation should make us refreshed. So, thoughtless means what? Thoughtless means wordless also. When there is no thought, we will forget the world, we will forget the my egoistic small identity also. That is the time automatically we get refreshed. So, even after that also, if we think that the world, is, world will, or something from the world will make me fulfilled, then it is not the right thing. We should understand that nothing from the world is ever going to make me fulfilled. So there is, the desires become redundant. It is not that desires will have to go. Desires become redundant and the mind becomes placid. With that mind, with that mind, with the joy, you do whatever comes to be done, everything they do. A knower does much more than the other people, almost ten times the other people they work, even at their old age also. Our Swamiji is now eighty-six years old and he is so active in everything, but it is not for thinking that what I do, there will be some result and that will make me happy. Not with that, a person who has discovered the joy within will never expect any joy from the world. It will have its small joy and suffering, everything, in everything his mind will remain blessed. <laughs> so, the meditation should be such that it relieves us of our all the worldly problems, that we are constantly running after things thinking that it will make me happy but nothing makes us finally permanently happy. So once we know that nothing from the world is going to make me happy, immediately we can feel that we are happy. Whatever we do, we will do happily. And we go on doing things out of that joy, not looking for joy. Do you get my point? Generally we do something that it will have some result, that will have some result and finally with that what will happen? I will become happy. Anything we do, you look into your mind, is it not that the, we are expecting finally to become happy out of it? I am working because I will get some money. With the money I will have this, have that. With that my family will be happy. If my family will be happy then I will be also be happy. Anything you detect, finally will be, I will become happy. But 
that happiness is only short lived and we never become fulfilled by that at all so if we keep that away that by the result i will become happy if you can keep it away then whatever you do you do out of happiness your mind always remain in a cheerful state in a placid state it, this placidity placidity when i say it is not just joy in suffering as well in sorrow as well as in happiness the mind will remain placid it is out of the understanding that the world consists of both creation and destruction birth and death happiness and suffering we are there to accept everything from the world when we have that universal vision we can always remain happy in a placid state of the mind whether we are coursing through suffering or sadness or uh, sorrow or have some happy incidents also the placidity of the mind never goes because we are not looking for happiness from anything outside the happiness is right within actually i don't have to say so much because it is not happiness a product of the mind it is never produced outside happiness is a product of the mind so we depend on external object to produce that happiness suppose very simple that we all everybody likes to be loved is it not is there any human being who doesn't like love but the our problem is that we want to be loved by others and if it doesn't come then we become unhappy is it not but the solution is that we have to understand there that it is the love that makes us happy when we are clubbing that love with a person or with any object or anything then it is getting tarnished that with the object only we are getting the touch of love but you if you can disassociate the love from there that love makes us happy you love everybody you will become happy for always you will become happy we are looking for others to love me and when that is available we are happy but it is the love which makes us happy so the solution lies in loving everybody loving in our, loving our enemy also always being filled with the love is it not a simple solution but we don't think it is a solution which has been practiced and tested by many you can also test no doubt about it suppose you are not able to bear a person even the sight of the person stresses you you decide that now the stress is caused in your own mind the sight of the person that nothing happens to that person it is we are creating the stress and we are suffering from the stress but suppose i decide that today somehow i will try to love that person also you go you hug the person or really try to love the person at least try to appreciate some of his virtues or qualities or so which you have never appreciated you have been only looking for the defects which you can blame instead of that you find out the qualities you look into the qualities and start appreciating them openly not as a fake appreciation try to appreciate you will find that you are relieved of the stress the stress which was which was in your mind which was training your mind that mind will get a great relief suppose we are blaming somebody criticizing somebody nothing happens to the other person when we are blaming criticizing it is in our own mind we are creating the stress and if we stop doing it if we start appreciating people even aggrandizing their even magnifying their small small qualities also good qualities we start appreciating looking at the qualities you will find that every moment of your life will become so joyous now why am i going into all these details only to say that our nature its love is our birth right it is our soul parameter the joy is our birth right it is our par- it's a parameter of our soul the expansion and infinitude is our birth right it is the our soul is infinite it is infinitude we are by our methods we by our desires by our constrictions of the mind by our criticism and blamingness and what not we are making our mind small we are making we are not able to resonate with the soul with the our real identity we are creating a constricted mind and 
not being able to appreciate and, and uh, feel the joy the love within now meditation is supposed to solve all these problems by how by going within and discovering this real identity that is the purpose of meditation aim of meditation so i wanted to present this that this is the aim of meditation the aim of ultimate aim of meditation is to attain this yoga which means the dissolution or fusion of our small constricted identity in the real infinite or transcendental identity the consciousness by that our intelligential quest of finding out the truth gets fulfilled and the emotional quest of finding out happiness also gets fulfilled this is a introductory presentation now if you have questions i will answer the questions i i have a couple of questions regarding the alambana like upanishad alambana on uh, how we can start meditating mm. and uh, how we can have the akhanda karavrutti going from uh, saguna karavrutti huh? saguna kar karma upasana and saguna karavrutti saguna ah saguna karavrutti to many you tell me one I by know. one I the first to... you say how to start the meditation one is start the meditation mm. then alambana for uh, huh. Alambana. this much i will do then again you ask the next question okay. because okay. i will get confused okay see in uh, you must have heard about patanjali yoga sutra which generally those who practice meditation they follow it gives very simple instructions for meditation one is that first sukhasanam are you allergic to sanskrit no acha Sukh, sukhasanam means asana means posture sitting posture and sukha means comfortable that is first thing in when we try to meditate is we have to have a very comfortable posture hmm why otherwise the leg will pain the knee will pain and you will not be able to meditate you, have, you will not be able to forget the body even forgetting mind and forgetting intelligence is much later we won't be able to forget the mind even so first is sukhasana then he says prayatna shaithilya that means prayatna means effort shithila means lose prayatna shaithilya means effortlessness this is very important because the moment we sit for meditation oh i am going to meditate gone we become effortful that i have to meditate now no no effort at all effortlessness then comes ananta samapatti that means inducing infinitude in your mind because the mind is given to small small things it will still go on thinking so if you suppose think of the infinite sky or infinite space automatically the mind will lose uh, will get away from its small small clinging constrictions likes dislikes everything will completely your mind will become sky like these are the initial steps which we if we can take it will take us a quite a long way in the meditation first then the coming to the alambana part of it now here actually when we say ananta samapatti or infinite induce infinitude this is also an alambana you hold on to that <coughs> another in kathopanishad it is said that after presenting the omkara he says etad alambanam shreshtham etad alambanam param that is taking omkara as a when you say alambana means a support prop so as such the omkara represents brahma vidya that is the knowledge of the truth omkara has got two aspects of it one is it represents the knowledge of the truth knowledge in the upanishads knowledge of the ultimate truth that is for the knowledge practitioners and omkara as a symbol as well as a sound it can be used for meditating 
where we call it upasana, whatever. So it can be used as the alambana, as a prop. And the Upanishad is saying it is the best alambana, it is the supreme alambana. And taking this support, you can reach anywhere you like. That is the statement. Etad alambanam shrestham, etad alambanam param, etad alambanam jnatva brahma loke mahiyate. You can go to any level, to the, up to the Brahmic realization. How? Because this sound, this Omkara sound is Aum. It is going to the silence. So initially it is a full open sound. From there it goes within. Then finally it goes to silence. So if you focus on that, if your mind goes like that, you will finally, beyond the sound, you will discover the silence. There lies the ultimate. So this is a standard alambana which is taken. Now if you have some mantra given by some guru, your guru or so, in that case that can become an alambana. How will it become an alambana? You have to surrender to that mantra. That mantra is, mantra meaning is manana trayate iti mantra. It is not that japa, that just go on repeating, repeating with the mala, that is not the way. It sh should have a meaning which we should know and our focus should be on the meaning of the word, whatever is there. Not only that, generally if it is from a powerful source, you have got the mantra, it has its power. So, it gives a very easy alambana or support for us that we completely surrender to the power in the mantra. That is, I don't know where is the goal of meditation, I don't know what is the self, I don't know where lies my, the aim of my life, nothing I know, I only surrender to you. To you means that power. So, the question is the surrender, surrendering of the mind, that is an important point there. Holding on to that, you are able to surrender. Surrender means all other small, small things, everything will be gone. And that surrender will be able to take you to the last point. Is it okay? I can speak more, but this is sufficient, I think, on this. Huh. Uh, you, uh, I will answer one question and then again come back. Tell me. You can read out. Give the microphone. Sir, my question is, uh, sir, my question is that uh, from your introductory talk, what I could really make out is that um, meditation is more of a way of life than a spiritual discipline, because it is touching all part of your life, really speaking. Any spiritual discipline is like that. It is a full transformation of the life. Suppose I read the Upanishads or Bhagavad Gita. And in life we remain the same, then it is not called spiritual sadhana. Such knowledge is not the actualized knowledge. So anything in spirituality, when you practice, it has to have a full, wholesome transformation of our being. So that way meditation also is like that. It has to be a way of life. Thank you, sir. We won't call it way of life. Why call it way of life? Well, we can call also, but it's a great pursuit leading us to the greatest discovery. It's not just way of life. When we say way of, way of life, I feel that there is a little dilution that every morning I meditate for half an hour or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or one hour and I go on doing it. No, there should be a progression. Anything we do in the name of spirituality, there should be an evolution, a progression. If that is not there, we get stagnant, then it is not the right thing. Suppose we are doing puja, puja, puja for sixty years, seventy years we have done puja. But we never question that has God come nearer over these seventy years or have I gone closer to the God in these seventy years? Nobody will question. This is our foolishness. Same thing I am saying that suppose we are taking food and your hunger is not satiated, will you not question the food? That what am I taking? Similarly, in any practice, whether it is spiritual, religious, puja, um, pranayama, whatever, unless there is an evolution, unless there is a progression, we should question that. Meditation, every day I sit for some time and have some peace and go away. 
that is a way of life but if the meditation has to take me to the final goal where its effect will fall on all my activities that everything we will do out of cheerfulness out of joy not looking for joy at the end and everywhere i will love everybody everybody i will host host means in my mind i will embrace the whole world if that kind of an expansion of the mind is not taking place then that is not the right is it clear thank you sir thank you Hmm. um you actually give a very interesting cycle that uh, you you first get the desire and the desire gets fulfilled and at the time of happiness the actual desire is not there in that state but what is it that makes us want to kind of create the next desire why See, does this become a cycle see that is what the basic delusion is we are born first of all why do we want happiness let us question that that we are looking for happiness right from a baby also suppose a fruit or something is there even if a ball it will lick first because that is the way it experiments initially that is it is looking for something which will give him pleasure and yes. happiness so we are we say that we are born with in sanskrit we call it abhava bodha abhava bodha means with an insufficiency there is a lack in our within which we are born with and we there is another this insufficiency and delusion there is a delusion that we think that this insufficiency will be fulfilled by getting something from the objective world so we first it was the object was um, say milk or fruit or something eatable then the object changed into playing some games then that changed into having some rank in the class or so then maybe it is uh, having a career then it is having some spouse then it is having some good children then it is having grandchildren so the object goes on changing the happiness is not in the object it is because we are thinking that something from the world will make us fulfilled but it we never think that i have not got fulfilled by anything not only me anywhere in the world when we look at people that nobody has got fulfilled by getting anything from the world so can we not look at it in a different manner that where lies that so it is basically we are why we are born with the insufficiency because our sense organs are always looking outside our focus is always outside so the day we discover the joy within what happens is that we don't look for the joy outside we look within so now we can analyze that it is the our outward nature which is creating this lack in us the insufficiency in us is because of our outward orientation and the delusion that something from outside will fulfill us it never happens do you get my point we generally in the our scriptures there will be an example that the boy is playing and playing it gets bored with something it will go to something else something else like that then finally when he becomes absolutely tired and starts crying then the mother comes and puts the baby on her lap then the boy gets satisfied so we say that our shastras our scriptures are calling us calling us how long will you remain involved in the worldly play come back come back on my lap and the day we come back we understand that this is where the i was looking for just like the vapor which has come from the sea it is taken by the cloud finally it comes down as snow or rain on the mountain tops then it flows like a river when the river is flowing it doesn't know where it is going but the aspiration in it the flow in it it finally takes to the sea the moment it gets merged into the sea goes to its origin then it loses its that small identity anymore it becomes the sea that is the ultimate fulfillment like that we are born of that and when we get back to our real identity we become fulfilled does it mean yes. can i ask one more question mm. so how do you so you are i think it's actually very interesting that you said we are born with insufficiency and we think that we become sufficient by something external 
and that is we are born with insufficiency and delusion and the delusion, delusion that something from outside it's a delusion so is insufficiency the same in all human beings or uh, is it based on your karmas and you know past life and so on uh, that question i will not answer now because it will take us to a very long discussion um, it is whatever your past karma you will be born with insufficiency you know that to explain that there is a story again in the puranas they will put these stories that when uh, brahma created vasishtha vasishtha was the first son of the creator brahma brahma created vasishtha he found that the vasishtha doesn't do anything he just remains you can say in meditation sort of a thing he doesn't do anything at all so brahma thought that isse to koi kaam nahi hoga I, nothing can be done with this person because he doesn't move at all he is satisfied he is absolutely satisfied sitting so he put him the story says that he put vasishtha on his lap lap means to induce the the delusion and the insufficiency in him the moment he put him on his lap vasishtha started crying what did you do to me what did you do? i am suffering i am suffering so then brahma explained that well this is what i wanted now you are suffering you find out the redress for it how the suffering can be removed then you will become useful for the world you will do good things for the world so then vasishtha pursued and got the relief finally so there are storytelling way of talking about, but it's the truth the whatever the story says can i ask one more question hmm yeah. See, i have one question like once we have yeah, reached the stage of uh, dharana and dhyanam yeah uh, dharana and dhyanam hmm and uh, we know it's a continuous improvement process nobody will be there in the beginning or in the it is a journey hmm. and what are the measures that like, uh, i'm failing and how i can improve like uh, suppose i'm measures to... i will always say the measure is knowledge that whatever i am trying to expose you to yeah. to think and read or listen to or think finally whatever you listen to you have to rationally think about it and whatever to be done it will be done that first thing is to know that whatever i am pursuing there should be a progression Pro- i am clear in progression you understand no? there should be an evolution there should be an improvement yeah. transformation if that is not there we should question even spiritual sadhaks also that seekers also they become stagnant it is just because they are not looking into themselves that i am not progressing it becomes a cycle in the upanishads repeatedly it is said that normally people what do we do the morning we are getting up then we are doing then we are taking breakfast going out to the office coming back we are looking after this then going to sleep and again that day to day it is going in a cycle complete cycle it should not be a cycle the cycle should be like this yeah. that is as the cycles go you should progress in that yeah. can we put it as a part of the shravanam mananam nidhyasanam and janam is in between that how, how we can uh-huh. the actually shravana manana nidhyasana is for the first i said upanishadic sadhana yeah. it is called exclusive knowledge pursuit only f- few deserving people can take to that kind of a pursuit fully but definitely for others it can be a combination of all that is whatever bhagavad gita is presenting as buddhi yoga then meditation also is part of it and shravana manana nididhyasana will not easily come finally it will come but for the knowledge oriented people those who are not having much of desires or repulsions towards anything that is who are free of all hindrance for them it is easy and direct that is they listen to the truth shravana means to listening to the truth manana means applying all our rationality to understand that i am not able to understand swami ji is saying that i am infinite but i feel that i am small i am limited by the body how can i accept it so go on and asking asking i mean inquiring into it when the our intelligence finally says that yes this is what the truth is then further analysis is no more necessary then only the nididhyasana takes place 
when we are doubtless about the truth by applying all our rationality then nididhyasana takes place we generally explain that in manana or when we are analyzing and thinking it is like pouring water that the droplets they get broken drops fall like that sometimes we are thinking sometimes we are thinking something else whereas nididhyasana is like pouring oil that the mind doesn't go any more here and there it is an ek tatva ghana abhyasa that like taila dhara but like the oil pouring of the oil the mind constantly contemplates on truth so it is not generally um, the people are not fit for it when one becomes fit for it he can definitely do it and he will do it also even are pursuing other methods one when one becomes absolutely one pointed it will automatically come to us we don't have to really think of it and do it it will come automatically the mind will come to that even dhyana also i did not say it in our lineage generally our guru his guru his guru at least three generations four generations we know they always used to say that Uh, they are bengali so the dhyan korte hai na re dhyan hoy that means you don't have to meditate meditation happens that is it should not be an effortful meditation dawns so the real meditation it dawns i should have if you allow me i can have one more question hmm so like uh, prapanchopas hamam santam sivam advaitam and uh, Prat- it is what yeah. i said yeah. just like how, that how the, like janam how exactly like janam and meditation what is the role there and uh, nididhyasana how it takes me there from there to like from see as i said meditation also when it is properly directed is it not taking to you that causeless that beyond causality cause and effect chain that is the prapancha upashamam okay that when there is no world prapancha upashama means there is no world including your own personality everything has gone that is the beyond causality level so meditation will take you to that if you consider meditation to be that there it it is called nirvikalpa samadhi that peak of meditation is nirvikalpa even peak of nididhyasana also is jnana samadhi thank you thank you it comes see generally we have difficulty let us come to the practical point of difficulty in meditation because throughout the day we are involved engaged in various things and indulge in various things also either what we like or what we dislike both way we are indulging that is what we dislike also is occupying our mind too much stressing the mind even what we like also we are so throughout the day we are inviting all worldly thoughts worldly thoughts you understand uh, thoughts about the likes and dislikes of the world we say raga dvesha in bhagavad gita now suddenly 7 o'clock i have to meditate now we sit for meditation how can it happen throughout the day you are deliberately inviting all kinds of engagements suddenly if you tell the thoughts that now you all keep away i am going to meditate will they listen to you they will say that throughout the day you have been inviting us now is the time you are sitting for meditation all the more it is time your mind is now vacant we will come all of us will come and invade your mind so it works against nature so what we say we say but people don't do that is the problem <laughs> we say dhyana mukhinata this word although if you even if you dislike sanskrit at least you should remember this word dhyana mukhinata means orientation towards meditation dhyana means meditation mukhinata means the mukha means the face is looking towards meditation so it means oriented the mind should remain oriented towards meditation that is throughout the day whatever we are doing we may be engaged in hundreds and thousands of items but whatever is the aim in meditation we are looking for that will be like a search light that will be on bef- behind the mind that we are looking for the same goal 
then when you sit for meditation automatically throughout the day you have been inviting only meditation so that automatically the mind will go will withdraw from the world meditation will happen so swami ji what is the path to effortless meditation what is the starting point to get there and effortlessness to effortless meditation right what is the path to get to that point is there something that we can do every day what is the discipline that yes can? you can do would you like to do now sure it is to make your mind let go of everything there are two things here one is to let go means you understand whenever the thought is coming suppose you are worried about tomorrow in the office or day after tomorrow in the office what will happen or employee boss or in the family let go is the mantra for that let go an english mantra is the mantra for that that you leave leave it to nature nothing is going to happen finally you may die otherwise also we are going to die what is so great about dying maximum what can happen suppose we are fearful about some consequence what will happen my maximum i will lose my job i will be wandering in the street or maybe somebody will beat me the boss will sack me or i will die maximum and the, we have to let go all this any development let it come i will accept it nothing is there it is an acceptance also let go means without acceptance it will not go so completely let go whenever the thought comes whenever the involvement comes let go let go that should be the mantra to make you effortless hmm in another manner what anybody can try is that you try to understand what i am saying that the moment a thought comes to our mind we get involved in the thought suppose the office thought has come immediately i have reached office and something is happening some talks are going on the moment the mother's thought has come maybe he is she is sick or bedridden immediately what will happen i have to take her to the doctor this that and all so in the mind when you look within you watch your thoughts you will find that you are not able to watch your thoughts the moment one thought comes you start moving with that to get my point so the pursuit should be not to get rid of all thoughts don't look for thoughtlessness then you will struggle it will become effortful you will get tired fighting out the thoughts make emptying the mind no not necessary you just keep away from the thoughts and see them coming and going it is like suppose you are uh, standing like a tree on the bank of a river so many boats steamers they are going past a marriage party is going people are merry making the tree doesn't go down and get into the ship to enjoy with them do they the tree doesn't move a uh, dead body is being carried people are crying wailing the tree doesn't go and start crying along with them it just sees like that <coughs> the train of thoughts allow them to simply pass simply pass never getting involved in it if you can do it great will be the result i don't have to tell you you will yourself discover because you will discover the real witness nature of our consciousness that the thoughts are only objects before it nothing can affect it so this is another kind of meditation which will also take you to the truth so one is the let go another is watching just from the witness as an wit as a witness seeing the thoughts the train of thoughts going and it will not carry on if the thoughts will not stay unless we get involved in the thought the thoughts will not stay because we are getting involved with a certain thought it stays for a longer duration 
if you don't involve get involved the thoughts will come and go just in another thought will come and go like that and after some time you may find that your mind has become empty also see what happens is that when you are following a sound like om other things they keep away your mind gets focused on that and you are focusing as the om is changing you are focusing with that the mind is going then suddenly when the sound stops then what happens nothing else from the world has come to take over the consciousness the consciousness was expressing the sound so far when the sound is taken away the consciousness is left free so you come to know the consciousness there these are techniques which are prevalent in devotional life also in bengal we have seen we call it ashta prahara harinama sankirtana akhanda sankirtana that is they sing the harinama hare krishna hare rama etc for 7 days 24 hours all different groups will come and they will sing now what do they do? by constantly listening to the listeners the, those who are there sitting constantly what happens is that no other thoughts will come the brain the mind is banged constantly with that sound only and they have a way that suppose they start in a very slow motion laya the slow laya and they then take it faster 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 also to a higher pitch that taking it to a crescendo hari ram hari krishna very fast and the, with that the mridangam or whatever is there it will go on beating fast 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 so what happens is that that completely the mind gets engrossed in that sound taking it to the highest level suddenly they will stop we have seen that people have trance at that time trance means they will start trembling or they will get into meditation or they will have we call it vision some vision is happening actually it is the consciousness but because of maybe their devotion to krishna a form will be there the atma they will not experience there but what happens is that that sound takes away just like i said intense desire which keeps away all other small small desire fear and that is everything here also that intensity of focus with that sound the moment the consciousness is revealing that sound alone nothing else is there everything is forgotten it has become absolutely one pointed revealing that sound alone then suddenly if the sound goes then the consciousness is left to itself it's free it has not no world signal there no signal to reveal so it reveals itself not knowing the truth they have the there immediately some form will come or something will come they will have a different expression otherwise it will lead to immediate samadhi nirvikalpa samadhi so there are these props which can be used but our point is that whatever you may do you may have nirvikalpa samadhi also how to apply it in life so that the life become trouble free we should be able to the benef- apply the benefit of meditation to our active life interaction life what is that interactional sadhana which will make our interactive life also equally good or more we often say that why are you trying to meditate tell me because you are not happy with your mind in meditation generally what do you do you want to get rid of the mind the mind zero get rid of all the thoughts is it not thoughtlessness so why are you trying to become thoughtless because you are not happy with your thoughts the thoughts are creating stress in our mind it is creating suffering stress everything even if it is an indulgent if it's a joy so called happy thought also it is creating stress so we are not happy with our thoughts that is why we are wanting to become thoughtless that is why in deep sleep also we are so happy because it is a thoughtless state 
because in the wakeful state we are not happy with the thoughts. But if you apply the truth that whatever I said that the, it is the, our real identity is universal, it is universal love, universal expansion, everything. If you can apply that, you will become so happy with your interactive life that you will never want to meditate at all. The only good thoughts, noble thoughts, expanded thoughts will be generated by the mind, which we will put into action and try to do good for the society, everything. Everything will be so pleasant. Not only that, when you discover the truth everywhere, you will not miss it anywhere. Earlier, as long as we are getting into meditation and there we discover our I, and coming back we miss. That means it is not done, it's not permanent, it is state dependent, time dependent. So when we establish the same truth in our whole world, then we will not miss, miss that Atma or the Paramatma or Brahman or the truth. Anything, any, through, in any activity at all. So there lies the ultimate solution to life. Life is meant for activity, life is not meant for meditation. People thinking that the meditation is ultimate, they go into the cave and get absolutely non-active, remaining in samadhi like that. That cannot be the goal of life because the life is meant for activity. And there is a solution where remaining active also, we can get rid of all bondages, all kinds of constrictions. That should be our aim. So that is what we had mentioned about the limitation of meditation. Any other question? Other, huh? Our time is up to 5.30 or the 6 o'clock. You have some snacks and all, no? So that is after 6. Achha. Okay, um, Swamiji, um, first time I heard the human suffering described in just two words, mm. insufficiency plus delusion. And uh, first of all, it's extremely brilliant. I just want to say that. But uh, since we know it is the case that we cannot do anything about you know, being born with insufficiency, how do we teach the fact that it is a delusion at a, as young age as possible so that life becomes, that you don't have to meditate for that state. Mm. Because you also said beautifully that act, uh, you know, life is meant to be, uh, life is all about activity because you also have your dharma. So I was thinking if all the children become vasishta, then it becomes a very boring planet, right? Everybody is like very quiet. So I'm glad you kind of said that activity is very important. So how do we teach children that it is delusion so early on so that we don't no. go through whole For life. Teaching children the best method is to practice, that is practice ourselves. When you actualize the knowledge and apply it in all your activities everywhere, you will find that you don't have to tell them anything, they will pick up from there. And whenever necessary, you approach through knowledge, tell them that this is what it is and there lies. They will understand. When we speak from the experiential level and rational level, they will understand also. So the first thing is to not just, I have known so I can put it to others. It will not work. Just like Gandhiji's example. You know that it's very common. That a mother brought a child to Gandhiji. That he only takes sugar. Too much of sugar, I, we tell so many times that it is not good for your health, not good for your health. But the boy doesn't listen. Mahatma, you please tell him so that he can listen to you. Mahatma said, you come please next week, next Sunday or something, seven days or ten days later. So the lady took back the child and came back after ten days. Mahatma said that, see, don't take sugar. It is very bad for health. You will develop many diseases. And that's all. So the mother asked that, Mahatma, you could have told this ten days ago also. Why did you ask us to come back after ten days? It's such a simple statement. Mahatma said, I was also fond of sugar. I have to leave sugar for ten days. I lived without sugar and then only I have told him. 
so, so that it has its effect. So that is true everywhere, that we try to more, think more and more wholesomely and have a complete wholesome understanding of the truth. Initially it will be just an intelligential understanding. When we apply the truth in daily life, it will be a living truth. All whatever we are speaking is a, it's a living knowledge. So, it has to become living knowledge, then it will have effect on others and if you say also, they will listen. So, at least to some extent we have to appreciate and practice it, then it will be all right. Mm. I don't meditate at all. <laughs> that is why I can speak. <laughs> no, no. But suppose I have nothing to do, then automatically the mind sinks in. I don't. I have done a lot of meditation. That throughout the day it was meditative. After initiation from my guru, for about I cannot say exactly. I don't remember. It could be three months, or it could be even up to one year also, but with a lesser degree. But first three four months. I was not able to even eat properly. The body had become emaciated. Um, food I will take, it won't go like that. It was so much of that I understood wholesomely what my Gurudev meant when he said that meditation korte hai na re, meditation hai. That you don't have to meditate, but meditation dawns. Walking on the street, suddenly the meditation dawns. To be safe, we go away and sit on a culvert or so. It was like that. And Baba told us, cautioned us that never sit on the roof or so where there is no parapet or on the road you have to be very careful that it should not take over. He himself had fallen over the uh, conveyor belt once and had a great accident. In his uh, sadhana time, he was working in Kashipur gun and shell factory. So suddenly he was in meditation he fell on the con conveyor belt, but somehow got saved also, somebody saved him. So, at one time we have done enough of meditation, till we became satisfied with it. Now when there is not, sometimes if we feel withdrawal, we will withdraw like that. Swamiji, our Gurudev, his photo is not there, no? Uh, Swami Bhumanandaji, ji, he says, he always describes himself as, I was a meditation monger. That actually he was indulgent in meditation, he was meditating too much. So, one day in the ashram when he was meditating, one uh, local villager came for some help or something. He was not able to get out of the meditation. Somehow he could get up and go and attend to him and found that it was a great need for the person. So after giving him whatever to be given or whatever to be done, I don't know, that those days only the ashram had a telephone, there was no telephone in the village. So anybody needing any hospital or police or so, they used to come to the ashram. What was it, I don't know. So Swamiji says that that day I decided that I will not meditate anymore. What am I doing every day getting into Samadhi and coming back? What is that? There is no growth. Why should I go it, do it again and again every day? There is nothing in it except having some peaceful time or so, that's all. So he stopped from that. Except for putting people into meditation, he meditates. That is, in initiation, generally it will be together with others. That is different. So meditation is a need up to a certain level. Thereafter it is all in the knowledge, purity, expansion, all these things, till the mind becomes the soul. We generally say that the pure mind itself is the soul. It's very simple, suppose anything, suppose a ball is standing, another ball is moving. When it is hitting the standing ball, the standing ball starts moving, there's an in interchange of energy, is it not? Similarly, in our life also, whatever is spoken of about the Atma, the soul, the concept of the soul, 
if we go on thinking about it thinking about it what will happen the all the qualities and parameters of the soul our mind will take up suppose you constantly blame somebody about some defect you will find that that defect will be in you also it will come by constantly meditating on his defect the defect will dawn in you whereas if you start appreciating good qualities in others you will find that automatically you have developed some good qualities because it is the mind input whatever you are giving to the mind it's a very simple technique to how to have a good mind just read good things think good things talk to good people have good thoughts the mind will become good so like that constantly interacting with the concept of the soul the mind becomes the soul that is the last pursuit in my time when i was meditating the meditation this also you can try but you are all always in ac room closed away from the nature actually meditation even when we meditate in nature also suppose you have sat under a tree our tendency will be oh now i am meditating i will not hear anything so we are actually cutting us off from the nature is it not even if we sit in a garden or in nature also to meditate our idea is i am closing up ourselves shutting off ourselves which is absolutely the opposite meditation is expanding us and hosting the whole universe like that so suppose it is evening time it is morning time dawn early morning what is nature doing at that time the trees are moving towards light everything is going towards activity it's a life the blossoming of life is it not so if you can feel the trees the leaves will become taut you can feel the aspiration of nature towards light the aspiration towards expansion aspiration aspiration towards growth evolution so that is the time in dawn when we meditate we should harmonize with that aspiration so if we do it then you will find lot of knowledge opening everything dawns at that time that you will feel that so many concepts which you had not understood earlier it suddenly becomes clear it's only by the tuning ourselves with nature whereas in the evening what is nature doing birds are coming back the leaves are folding in the whole the life is closing up within with that harmoniously when we also that is the time we should withdraw and go into the silence inside you will find that it takes us to samadhi so called that zero state zero and infinity are same actually so this i am only trying to point out the fundamental principles there what are we doing in the name of meditation we should not shut us off shut off from everything we should rather become like the ocean like the spark sky like the space and harmoniously do everything it's a it's a process of complete melting getting merged in the nature so shall we stop now